The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. My name is Lee Lowry, and I serve as the Executive Director for the American School Health Association. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Creating School Communities of Support for Children with Food Allergies. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the American School Health Association. Otherwise known as ASHA, we are the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health and that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 800 individuals represents school health as administrators at the local, state, and national levels, as health and educational professionals in a pre-K through 12 school setting, and as academics who conduct research that informs school health professionals. We're also the proud publishers of the Journal of School Health, a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of ASHA can elect to receive a hard copy or electronic copy of the journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our bi-weekly e-newsletter, School Health Action as well as free continuing education hours through webinars, such as today's presentation, and through CE qualifying JOSH articles. If you haven't already, please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the ASHA community. Visit us at ashaweb.org to learn more. As I mentioned, the continuing education credit for today's webinar is free for all members. If you are a non-member and you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, we require a payment of $30. After the webinar, you can receive one Category 1 CECH for MCHES and CHES, one CNEIR for nurses, one CPEU for RD and DTRs, or a certificate of attendance based on 70% or more participation today. Participation is measured by the amount of time the webinar remains active on your screen. We'll provide details for obtaining CE in a post-webinar email that will go out this week. A couple of notes before we begin. Your phones will remain muted for the 60-minute duration of this webinar. If you have a question for our presenters, please type them into the questions box on your screen. We will answer your questions today as time allows. All unanswered questions will be responded to and provided in a post-webinar email that you will receive this week. We'll also include the evaluation survey, instructions for submitting for CE, a recording of the presentation, as well as additional information based on today's presentation. Before I introduce today's speakers, they would like to know a little more about you so that they can gauge their presentation to fit our audience's needs. Please help us by answering the following poll question. What is your role in school health? Are you a school or district administrator, an educator, a health services professional, a parent? Or you can respond that you don't work in a school. Okay, all right, we have Mike and Ann. All right, so now let's get started with today's presentation. We're delighted to have Michael Pistoner and Ann Sheets presenting Creating School Communities of Support for Children with Food Allergies. Today's presenters include Dr. Michael Pistoner, who is a pediatric allergist for Harvard Vanguard Medical Associate and voluntary instructor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. He is the father of a child with food allergies and has a special interest in food allergy management and education in the school setting. He has served as a voluntary consultant for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health School Health Services since 2008 and was a reviewer and gave comments for the CDC's voluntary guidelines for managing food allergies in schools. He is a fellow in the American Academy of Pediatrics, where he is a member of the Council of School Health and the Section of Allergy and Immunology. He is also a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, 
where he is a member of the Adverse Reaction to Food Committee and Food Allergy in School, excuse me, Food Allergy in School Subcommittee. He serves on the boards of Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, New England Chapter, the National Association of School Nurses Editorial Board, and the National Food Allergy Management and Education Advisory Board. Additionally, Dr. Pistoner is the author of Everyday Cool with Food Allergies, a co-author of Living Confidently with Food Allergy, and is co-founder and content creator of AllergyHome.org. Our second speaker, Ann Sheets, was the Director of School Health Services at the Massachusetts Department of Health from 1990 to 2013, when she retired from government service. In this role, she was responsible for providing consultation to the Commonwealth's 2,100 school nurses, developing regulations for school health, implementing continuing education programs through the Northeastern University School Health Institute, editing the Comprehensive School Health Manual, 2007 version, overseeing the essential school health services service grants, implementing school health data systems, and establishing performance improvement programs for school nursing services. She saw her major responsibility as supporting over 2,000 Massachusetts school nurses in their critical role of caring for the Commonwealth's 1.2 million students. Ms. Sheets has a BSN from Cornell University, New York Hospital School of Nursing, a Master's in Public Health from the University of Michigan, and a graduate certificate in management from Harvard University Extension. Welcome, Michael and Anne. I am now going to turn it over to you. We're just switching our screens here. If you just give us a moment. Michael, are you muted? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All right, great. Um, well, thank you so much for having us. It's a real honor for Ann and I to be here. And uh, um, Lee and Asha, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, this is a uh, topic that is near and dear to both Anne and my hearts. Um, and we have uh, really seen a humongous need for bringing education um, to our schools and to our uh, health care and, uh, um, and school nurse communities. And, uh, um, and with that, I'll get started. Um, we are hoping today to help bring communities of support into the schools throughout the United States. Now, just before we get to the nitty-gritty, um, a couple of housekeeping things. Some of the details that I go through, I'm going to be going through very quickly today because we have a whole lot of content that we're going to want to hit in a short amount of time. And much of this content, in addition, extra details can be found on the schools.allergyhome.org site. And I've circled a couple places where when the site gets open, you'll be able to see where some of this specific content can be found. So if I go a little fast or if I leave off some details, then the additional details can be found here. As we all know, food allergies are increasingly common. They can be life-threatening and parents rely on us in the school community to care for their children when they're not in the care of their parents. Unfortunately, in the United States, deaths in preschools and deaths in schools still occur, and they don't have to. With food allergies comes uncertainty. What is safe? What is not? What is necessary? What is not? And without the facts, often can lead to fear. If the parents of kids with food allergies are afraid that schools are not taking their children's safety into consideration, 
they will get angry. If the parents of children without food allergies are afraid that the needs and educational needs of their children are being compromised by changes in the school that they don't deem as necessary or important, they will become angry. Fear and anger can divide communities. So the goals of this talk, the goals of our talk, are to help you partner with others to replace the uncertainty of food allergy with facts and empowerment, to help you provide an awareness within your school communities and others that can save lives and help decrease divisiveness, and to help you motivate and inspire schools to create communities of support. Now traditionally, the heavy lifting has been done by parents. About a decade ago, a lot of the responsibilities for educating staff, for educating the parents and students within these communities fell on the shoulders of the families of children with food allergies. Now this is tactically challenging. Um, these folks also have full-time jobs and it can be really socially difficult to be able to pass along the needed information to be able to care for the kids in the school setting throughout the day. Fortunately, it shouldn't be and doesn't have to be the parent's responsibility because they're a part of a community. Who's in our school communities? We have staff and administration, we have the students, and we have the parents. An extremely important player in these school communities are our school nurses. They are absolutely critical, and when it comes to food allergy and anaphylaxis, no one is better positioned to care for children with food allergies. School nurses care. They coordinate. They work with physicians, parents, school staff, and students. They advocate. They ensure that the children's health and self-esteem are protected. They respond. They recognize and treat anaphylaxis. And the role that I'm really going to focus in on is going to be education. Um, the school nurses are really the champions when it comes to teaching school communities about food allergy management. Now as we've seen, negative attitudes can travel through a community very quickly. If teachers don't understand why it is that we aren't having donuts in the classroom for a child's birthday, and they aren't able to explain to the parents why they can't bring in these outside foods and then the children start getting frustrated and upset. A negative wave can pass through a school that ultimately can compromise adequate food allergy policies and can hurt children with food allergies. What we can do today is start with a baseline that we can use to enlighten communities with food allergy awareness. We can use targeted school education use evidence-based information when available, best practice standards otherwise. The recommendations that we pass along should take variations in school resources and developmental capabilities of the student body into account. These recommendations will need to be practical, and the education that we deliver will need to be relevant to the role of the people who are teaching. Now, food allergy awareness can spread, and spreads faster than the negative that can come out of miscommunication and a lack of understanding. This positive awareness, if the teachers understand why it is that they need to do certain things to keep kids with food allergies healthy and safe, if the students from the bottom up want to protect their peers, and then they go home and they teach their parents what they learned today in class, and mom, please do this so we can keep the kids in our school who have food allergies safe. These types of positive interactions, these types of food allergy awareness can spread like wildfire through a school. No longer does it have to be the sole responsibility of the family with food allergies. Now we can have a shared responsibility, and we should. In each of our schools, there's no reason to recreate the wheel anymore. 
Now wonderful resources have been created to be able to implement food allergy policies um, that are sound and practical. There's no reason to start from scratch. Some of these resources, especially the CDC guidelines, can really make the life of the school or, or whoever it is responsible, in most cases the school nurse, for creating these policies, um, something that, that, that should not be a tremendous burden. And we'll talk about some of these resources in a bit. So these voluntary CDC guidelines help guide schools in the management of food allergies. Experts contributed to create these, um, and these are folks who've had experience in school health and the management of food allergies and anaphylaxis. The CDC guidelines provide an excellent foundation to implement school policies, and they were written in a way that allows for variation in implementation. So they could be used in an elementary school, in a middle school, in a high school, and also in a K through 8. There are five priority areas in these CDC guidelines. The first is to help deliver appropriate food allergy management for the individual student. The second is that schools are prepared for allergic emergencies. The third, staff gets food allergy training and professional development. The fourth, students and families get food allergy education. And the fifth is that educational environments are healthy and safe. Now let's get started with some of the basics. These are things that you're going to want to pass along to your food allergy community. And as I mentioned before, you're going to want to deliver this information to each of the populations, the parents, the staff, the students, in a way that they can understand, in a way that's relevant to them. Now, the direction that I'm going in right now is what we'll be passing along to staff. The definition, it's an abnormal immune response to food protein, and remember that point. The most common allergens are milk, egg, peanut, tree nut, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. But keep in mind and pass along to your schools that people can be allergic to practically any food, and all food allergies need to be taken seriously. The symptoms, there can be skin symptoms, but also remember that there don't have to be skin symptoms. 10 to 20 percent of severe allergic reactions have no skin findings. That being said, though, skin findings commonly are rash, itching, flushing, hives. You can also see lip, tongue, throat, eye swelling. People can also have red, itchy, watery eyes. People's GI system can also be, be compromised. They can have abdominal pain, cramping, feel heartburn, nausea, vomit, have diarrhea. Breathing can be affected. Their upper respiratory system can be affected. They could have sneezing, nasal congestion, hoarseness in their voice, difficulty swallowing, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness. Their cardiovascular system can also be compromised. They can have dizziness, blueness, chest pain, fainting, neurologic system also. They can get irritable cranky, sweat, and ultimately death also can ensue. The majority of allergic reactions occur within minutes up to a few hours after exposure. Anaphylaxis is severe life-threatening allergic reaction. It can start with mild symptoms and as I mentioned, some have no skin findings. Epinephrine is the first line treatment of anaphylaxis. It works quickly but in many cases it's temporary and it's going to be necessary to get people experiencing anaphylaxis by ambulance to the hospital for further observation. It's also important to keep in mind and to spread onto your staff that first time allergic reactions occur in school and your staff will need to be ready. Other causes of anaphylaxis are stinging insects, latex, medication, exercise, environmental triggers, cold, and in some cases we don't know what's caused them. Deaths unfortunately occur in schools, and there are some risk factors for food allergy related fatalities and near fatal reactions. Those are being allergic to peanut or tree nut, being an adolescent or young adult, 
having asthma, having prior anaphylaxis, relying on antihistamines, and the biggest contributor is having a delay or a lack of administration of epinephrine. And I'm going to say it again. The biggest risk is having a delay or a lack of administration of epinephrine. Now, as we've seen, with food allergies can come real emotional and social impact on kids. Children can experience fear of adverse events and death, fear of ridicule, fear of social isolation, and have limitations in activities. In one study, teens noted that their most concerning limitations were, or, or that their biggest concerns were having limited social activities, having limited food choices, feeling as if they were a burden on others, and pay attention to this one, not having enough education to others about food allergy at school, but they didn't want to be the ones to do it. So that's where we all come in. Unfortunately, food allergy related bullying also exists. Um, and uh, um, they say that about one study showed that 35% of kids over age five have been bullied, teased, or harassed about their food allergies. And having policies that, um, that, that have a hard line on bullying are going to be important, and especially food allergy related bullying, as this can be life threatening. Now, allergic reactions can be prevented and dealt with reasonably while maintaining quality of life, and this is something that we're going to all want to aspire to. Now, how do you pull off something that seems so complicated in a place where there are so many participants? Try to break it down into something simple. We can break down food allergy management into two pillars, the pillars of prevention and emergency preparedness. These pillars need to be applied at all times and in all settings throughout the school. Now the first pillar of prevention, we're going to need to act to prevent accidental exposures. We're going to need to avoid, communicate, and teach. Act. Now we'll start with avoid. Different ways to come in contact with an allergen are through the mouth, breathing it in, touching the skin, and in the nose and in the eyes. Through the mouth is the most dangerous and most common way to have an accidental exposure that causes a reaction. Now to avoid oral exposure, each label on food should be read every time. Keep in mind that ingredients in products can switch without warning, so each time you're going to open the Ritz crackers for Jimmy, you're going to have to still read the box to make sure that those ingredients haven't changed. All staff should understand labeling laws and their limitations. Staff should be taught to avoid items with advisory statements. Now, if students are eating these, this will be something between the parents and the healthcare provider, and they'll need to communicate that to the school nurse and then ultimately to the staff. But folks should be trained to err on the side of caution and avoid unless undone. And keep in mind that outside foods are a very common source of allergen and common cause of accidental exposure. Another way to come in contact with allergen is through inhalation. To address this, um, Mount Sinai participated in a study where they looked at children and they held cups of peanut butter in front of them. Now of these kids, these, they happen to have peanut allergy, none of them had an allergic reaction. And this is reassuring. Um, that smell that you smell is caused by a volatile organic compound. Remember, I said earlier that the majority of allergic reactions are caused by proteins. Now, that being said, we do need to be careful of potential inhalation exposures to food allergen. Reactions can occur with active cooking, also with anything that sends proteins up in the air. Um, we have to take caution with powders, flour, small particulates, crushing, grinding, burning, um, these are all going to be things that can put food allergens into the air. Now skin contact is something that we'll need to, to protect against. Um, now healthy skin 
is a good barrier. Some small studies looked at this and what they found was that contact in children with peanut allergy on their skin with peanut did cause local hives and skin findings in about a third to 40 percent, but nobody had full body allergic reactions. What that showed was that isolated skin contact on intact skin did not cause severe reactions. But that being said, the skin was not open and oozing, it wasn't an active eczema lesion, and these kids didn't touch it and then put their hands in their mouths. Now, one study showed that kids between the age of two and five put their hands or an object in their mouths up to 40 times an hour. A similar study looked and showed that adults put their hands in their nose, eyes, or mouth 15 times an hour. So any skin contact with allergen can easily turn into an oral exposure. Cross contact is the presence of unintended food allergen. Allergens can be transferred from objects, saliva, and food. Allergens can withstand heating and drying. Routine training for all staff about sources of cross-contact and prevention of exposure is absolutely essential. So what works to clean to prevent cross-contact? Um, one study showed that soap and water, as well as commercial hand wipes, work well to clean hands, but hand sanitizing gels like Purell do not work. That same study showed that soap and water, commercial cleaners, and commercial wipes work well to clean surfaces. Now, we we'll need to keep in mind the different developmental capabilities of kids when dealing with and preventing cross-contact. Little children, as I mentioned earlier, explore their environment with their hands and their mouths. And the bigger children sometimes explore each other with their mouths. And so these are all going to be different issues of cross-contact that we'll need to think about and we'll need to train our staff for. Now, there is a specific additional resource for cross-contact exposure that could be shared with your staff and um, we'll have that link available. The C of ACT is to communicate. You act to prevent accidental exposures and communication is key. So staff and volunteers will need to know which students under their care have a food allergy and they'll need to discuss this and get trained by the school nurse. Staff and volunteers will need to alert others, um, like subs, coaches, volunteers, uh, about the children who they're ultimately going to be responsible for. We all need to keep in mind, though, that privacy must be protected, and prior to sharing health information, this will need to be discussed with the school nurse and or principal to confirm parental consent. For staff who are directly responsible for the care of the children, they'll need to review, understand, and have a copy of the emergency care plan accessible. Staff and volunteers will need a means to communicate with the school nurse and emergency services. An emergency identification jewelry is recommended for the kiddos with food allergy. Schools will need to notify parents of events where food is served and inform all parents and students, students about rules, practices, and bullying policies regarding food allergies. At the beginning of the year is an optimal time and then also whenever there's changes. As far as students, encouraging a supportive environment and avoiding using language and activities that may isolate kids with food allergies will be key. Staff will want to make sure and make it clear that bullying and teasing are never okay. The T of ACT is to teach. S teaching students is important. Staff can and should lead by example and model supportive and allergy aware behaviors and attitudes. They'll need to educate students about bullying and teasing. Staff also can work with each other to consider including as part of, or to work with school nurses to get support so they can create lesson plans for um, the kids in their schools to help create these supportive environments. 
don't want to teach points in a developmentally appropriate way, discussing briefly signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, uh, the importance of not bullying, getting help, getting a grown-up, management strategies, supporting peers and others, and specific tools to teach these kids can be found at um, schools.allergyhome.org and also the FAME Toolkit. And Anne is going to be talking a bit more about the FAME Toolkit shortly. Teaching parents is key. School nurses, teachers, and administration can provide food allergy awareness to all parents um, to, to share with them food allergy school and classroom policies and relevant food allergy management strategies to take home the importance of consistent messaging um, and to, to also the importance of understanding and support. Schools can use announcements, letters, email blasts, listservs, websites, PTA meetings, and other events to educate their, their parents in their schools and using other resources as a way to do it too. School nurses can work with the families with food allergies to attempt re-education if needed, and school nurses and others can act as liaisons to facilitate positive parent-teacher and parent-parent -parent interactions. And now the second pillar of food allergy management is emergency preparedness. Again, this needs to be something applied to all settings and at all times. Staff will need to be prepared to react, to recognize anaphylaxis, to give epinephrine, and to activate emergency response call 911. The first step is recognition of anaphylaxis. Who should be prepared to, to identify allergic reactions? Anyone who interacts with students, staff, or visitors. Staff should know their role in the school's emergency protocol. And now some staff will be trained under the direction of the school nurse or doctor to recognize and treat anaphylaxis in those with a known allergy when a school nurse or doctor is not available. Now keep in mind that the longer anaphylaxis remains untreated, the more end organ effects occur and treatment becomes increasingly difficult. One key tool to help in the recognition of anaphylaxis is the emergency care plan. This is a critically important and practical document. It should be understandable for non-licensed staff. It should be accessible for all of those responsible for the care of the child. And it should be strongly encouraged for this document to be submitted for all children who have a food allergy or other potential causes of anaphylaxis. Now the E of REACT is epinephrine. Epinephrine is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. A responder who identifies anaphylaxis should contact the school nurse immediately. In most states, for those with a known allergy and an auto-injector, a trained, non-licensed staff member can administer an auto-injector in the event that a school nurse is unavailable. Make sure to discuss your state's regulations with your school nurse and or principal. States, for those without known allergies, specially trained, non-licensed responders may be able to administer epinephrine in the event that a school nurse is not immediately available. Again, discuss this with your um, school nurses and principal because this is going to be dependent on these new state's laws and local laws or regulations as well. Again, epinephrine is the first line treatment of anaphylaxis. It works quickly but is short acting. Further evaluation and management in the emergency department is essential. Keep in mind and drive this home, antihistamines are not first-line treatment of anaphylaxis and do not stop or prevent it. Non-licensed responders may also not be able to give antihistamines in some states and schools, so make sure that this is something that's understood when passing along and, and, make, and, and, and looking at these emergency care plans. Now, there are currently four auto injector brands available in the United States, Adrenaclick and Generic, AviQ and EpiPen. For each of the specific students who has the specific auto injectors, staff should be trained on those specific auto injectors and be ready in the case of those specific students. It's recommended that there's two available doses um, because some kids need a second 
dose. Epinephrine should be stored in a well-defined, secure, but accessible location, not locked. We should try to avoid extreme temperatures, keeping it at room temperature. It shouldn't be stored in a car because there it could be overheated or it could freeze. And the act of REACT is to activate emergency response. Someone should contact the nurse if available and 911. The caller should state that the child is having anaphylaxis and request licensed responders that can administer epinephrine. The child must be taken to the emergency department via ambulance. After epinephrine is administered, 911 should be called and then, only then, emergency contacts be contacted. No parent wants to hear that epinephrine has not been administered and 911 has not yet been called. Um, again, that is the last step, is notifying the parents. Keep the child or adult from rising to an upright position. Um, in the case of uh, if the child or, or adult is not vomiting or not in respiratory distress, then keeping them supine on their back is helpful. But if they are having a compromised airway, if they are nauseous and vomiting, then keeping them in a position of comfort will be important. You can roll them on their side. Um, and in the case of respiratory distress, this is also something that we're going to want to make sure that we don't put them in an uncomfortable position. Now, after a reaction, complete all appropriate documentation as per school policy and state and local regulations. Review your team's emergency response with your school nurse and or administration. Provide support to the child and their family upon returning to school after experiencing an allergic reaction. Now, all of these prevention and preparedness skills, these pillars, will need to be applied in all settings in the school, classroom, school bus, gymnasium, cafeteria, anywhere in the school. Now, take home points. Act to prevent accidental exposures. Avoid, communicate, and teach. Be prepared to react. Recognize anaphylaxis. Give epinephrine and activate emergency response. No longer does this need to be only the responsibility of the parents. Use your resources. Don't recreate the wheel. And remember that educated communities help food allergy awareness take off. Now, for anyone interested, um, Allergy Home is launching third through fifth grade food allergy lesson plans and will be doing some pilot testing. Um, these lesson plans will be consistent with the CDC guidelines and linked to educational standards and cross-curricular in nature. Um, anyone who wants to participate can. So anyone who um, works with or teaches uh, kids third through fifth grade, um, uh, general ed, special ed, nurse, counselors, before after school program leaders, science or social studies, phys ed, um, uh, this will potentially be applicable to you. The lessons will be ready to pilot at the start of the new year. Participants will have until the end of the month to implement lessons and complete the survey. Um, and then access to lesson plans and an online survey will be emailed at the start of the new year. Those interested can choose to implement um, just one or all of the lessons depending on the needs. And if you're interested in participating, um, please uh, email uh, me and send a request to allergyhome at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Now I'll turn this over to Ann. Give us just a moment while we switch slides. Because of, uh, because of our time constraints, I'm going to start without the slides. And I want to thank Dr. Pistoner for his excellent presentation. We have worked together for many years and are doing our best to improve food allergy or complete life threatening allergy management. I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to present the Massachusetts experience in managing food allergies and managing allergies in the school setting. A special thanks go to all the school staff and especially the school nurses who have 
across the country who have worked so diligently to make our schools safe for these children. Briefly, the objectives are at the end of this presentation, we would hope that you would understand the importance of school-based policies uh, for life-threatening allergies, allergy awareness for all staff, availability of some very good resources, and data collection and data-driven policies. I would like to state at the outset that there is an urgent need for data collection on the prevalence of LTAs in every state as well as the need to track life-threatening allergic events and outcomes. In Massachusetts, we have seen an increase in the prevalence of students prescribed epinephrine, a proxy for the numbers of LTAs, acute LTAs. The Commonwealth rate of epinephrine prescribed for students rose from 7.2 per thousand to in 2001 to 25.1 per thousand in 2012. We do not know the reason for this. However, reportedly life-threatening allergies are increasing across the country. This has resulted in an increased risk for life-threatening allergic reactions in the school settings, and school administrators and staff uh, need to face these challenges. Massachusetts has had a long history of addressing this issue. In 1993, we promulgated the regulations governing the administration of prescription medications in public and private schools, a very comprehensive set of regulations governing all aspects of medication administration. I have the URL at the end of this presentation. The regulations define the school nurse as the manager of the program as she is the clinical expert on site. And the original regulations in 1993 permitted the school nurse to train unlicensed personnel in the administration of epinephrine by autoinjector to those students known to have an allergy. In that same year, 1993, the Essential School Health Service grants were launched in our state, and this began our data collection. So we've had rather a long history, and we've learned a lot, and, and hopefully can be helpful to others. We thought we had addressed the issue. However, in 2000, there were three Massachusetts school-related deaths of students experiencing anaphylaxis. At that time, the parents from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of New England and the Food Allergy Network approached me to write comprehensive guidelines for managing um, allergies in the school setting. This uh, need was further reinforced by the increased numbers of calls we at DPH received from parents of children with life-threatening allergies who were entering schools. These, these calls usually began the first week in July every year and lasted well into the school year. We decided to write guidelines for managing allergies in schools in uh, Massachusetts, and we felt that this uh, document should be issued from the Massachusetts Department of Education rather than the Department of Public Health as we recognize that school administrators tend to listen to the education agency more than public health. We had guiding principles which I share with you on this slide and again we, um, we felt that our guidelines would be the, the basis for policy development at the local level. I'm going to briefly describe our process because you may want to use this in your districts or state. Um, we first established a multidisciplinary committee under the auspices of the Department of Ed, consisting of allergists, parents, school physicians, and nurses, food service directors, and representatives from the Department of Education and Public Health. At the first meeting, we asked the parents to describe what was working in their schools and what was not. This is very important as these parents are truly fearful of sending their children into a school setting where they no longer have the control that they had at home. Based on this discussion, we developed an outline, assigned sections to various members of the committee, set aside a day where we could all work on computers in the same room, and we completed the first draft, probably the fastest policy development in the Department of Ed's history. 
Um, the points of emphasis, I just go over the major ones. Um, the first emphasis was the recommendation that there should be a full-time professional school nurse in any school with a student diagnosed with an allergy. This school nurse is responsible for managing all aspects of the program. Um, another major issue was we wanted preparation before uh, a child entered school and that was extremely important. Um, we added some, uh, we added recommendation that if possible a child should see an allergy just annually. Uh, we implemented our uh, guidelines in the fall of 2002. Just briefly, uh, we, we distributed them to the superintendents. We notified all school nurses. We had educational sessions and we placed them on the website. The challenges were many. Parents of students who liked peanut butter differed with those whose children were allergic to peanut butter. In one community, we ended up with a uh, town-wide community meeting with the mayor, so we figured these things out. We tried not to use the word peanut free, as this might give false security. Rather, we used the term allergy aware and worked on best practices considering the age of the child and the particular school environment. Preparing unlicensed school staff proved another challenge as we had uh, objections from the teachers' unions. However, when we made this a voluntary role and many teachers offered to do it, although there was some reticence. Some school bus companies objected to having their drivers trained. However, today in most Massachusetts schools, the contracts include epinephrine training for the drivers. A recent Massachusetts law requires all new school bus drivers to be trained in epinephrine administration by auto injector. We added uh, educational biphasic reactions and required that students be transferred by the emergency uh, service to the nearest hospital. Our efforts resulted in a better understanding on the part of school administrators about the need for school nurses to manage the program. Our numbers went up. Very quickly, the summer calls from frightened parents in Massachusetts stopped. These parents were using the guidelines to really work with their schools. However, calls from frantic parents in other states quickly grew exponentially, with many asking how we had increased the numbers of school nurses and how we had gotten schools to implement policy. The major result is that there have been no deaths in Massachusetts schools in the last 14 years. However, we must continue to be vigilant and prepared every minute of every day. Um, just briefly, um, I, I want to digress and say that uh, Mike and I and a whole range of professionals have been working with St. Louis Children's Hospital who have developed a comprehensive food allergy education and management guidelines and toolkit under the name of FAME. I have the URL here. And these guidelines will, are really, like the CDC guidelines, really helpful to schools and have a host of, of many helpful materials. Um, briefly, an overview of food allergy, roles of different uh, staff members, legal kinds of issues, et cetera. And these, this is a just a, um, a few slides to describe them, including this is the health professional's role. There are roles for everyone. Now I'm going to quickly go into um, the Massachusetts ex experience in quality improvement. In Massachusetts, while we had the guidelines, we did not have a tracking mechanism to determine how often anaphylaxis occurred in the schools, nor the outcomes. In 2002, as part of a quality improvement program, the department asked school nurses to report these data on a voluntary basis. However, when I revised the regulations, medication regulations in 2004, I wrote in this as a mandatory reporting. So we went from 49 reports, voluntary reports, in FY 2002 to 225 
mandated in 2010. We also learned uh, from this project about improvements we need to make. We amended the medication regs to address before and after school. Initially, 20% of individuals with life-threatening events had their first reaction in the school setting. This rose to 25%. Based on this, we advised schools to have a stock supply of epi and a standing order from our school physician uh, to give epinephrine to uh, individuals experiencing an anaphylactic event who were previously not diagnosed. The school nurse did this. Uh, sending the child to the hospital became an issue for parents because many times the children um, felt that uh, the children responded quickly to Abby and parents did not want to send them to the hospital, so we had to do a lot of educational biphasic or repeat reactions. For all states, data collection is important. For your state or district, do you know how many students or staff have a diagnosed LTA? what is the most frequent type of allergen, how many epinephrine administrations, how many of these were to individuals with no known history, who administered the epinephrine, and what was the outcome. If the answers are unknown, there are many risks as well as missed opportunities. Denial is a major problem. For years, I was told that Massachusetts is the only state with this problem, which I could not understand. Um, However, if one denies the problem, there may be a lack of preparedness when a child with LTA enters a school, failure to have policies in place, and another lost opportunity to really demonstrate the need for a school nurse and the importance of a school nurse. So the following slides will demonstrate some of the data collected in our state. This slide shows the number of epinephrine administrations. The number keeps going up. This is the age of individuals receiving it. I call your attention to those over 18. These are, include the teachers, other staff, parents, and vis visitors. Our school nurses have had to respond to many emergencies on school property. The most common allergens, again, um, affect uh, really pretty much mirror the national. Um, the, uh, the uh, events re resolving or uh, exposures resolving in anaphylaxis, uh, the main ones in our state are peanuts, tree nuts, fruit, fish, medications, eggs, and insect sting stings. This is a very important uh, slide showing the number of uh, individuals with not previously known um, to have a diagnosed life-threatening allergy and um, where the school nurse responded to them, and you can see it's 20 to 25 percent. Again, I mentioned that this led us to have a stock supply and a standing order. While many people expect that the symptoms of life-threatening allergic events occur in the cafeteria, these data demonstrate that these symptoms can occur anywhere but the highest percentage occur in the classroom. Again, this need, it lends credence to the need for school-wide um, education, uh, cleaning in classrooms, etc. A particular concern are field trips. Students with LTS usually have a 504 plan or may have a 504 plan to um, uh, to ensure that they are have uh, reasonable accommodations. Field trips should be planned well in advance so that the school nurse can provide a nurse or a staff train in epinephrine administration to accompany the students. I would also say school trips should be planned based on location. If it's bee season and you have a lot of insect allergies, it might not be a good idea to go up Mount Manana. Um, as mentioned previously, since 1993, Massachusetts regulations permitted unlicensed personnel to be trained to administer epinephrine by autojector. However, as demonstrated by these, this is the person most likely to administer the medications. 
as she or he is most skilled in assessing the student and most comfortable with the injections. And the um, vast majority of our um, epinephrine are administered by the school nurse or in, in the self-administration cases, the majority uh, of the students who give their own medications do it with the school nurse guiding them so that they can um, work on their independence as they moved into the adult, adult world or into college. So in any case, these data demonstrate further support for a full-time school nurse in any building where there is a child with a life-threatening allergy. I would say the major lessons learned in our data collection efforts is the need to be prepared for students with allergy, and this means all staff awareness. To assist this awareness, our Dr. Pistoner's website, allergyhome.org, we use that as an adjunct in teaching staff the CDC guidelines and the FAME guidelines. I would also mention a, a Massachusetts School Nurse Research Study where we studied, they studied how many of the students, the teenagers, were carrying their EpiPens, those with life-threatening allergies. The number was very few and many were expired. And so they tried um, a research project uh, reminding these students to carry them and basically for these teenagers there was no difference in the outcome except the ones that did carry, the few that did carry, did not have expired epipens. So the lesson, lessons to be shared with other states. Many states have begun to collect data and I would really urge every state to do this. The National Association of School Nurses, the Academy of Pediatrics, and the National Association of State School Nurse Consultants are working on data guidelines. We found it was helpful to start small, but then, as Dr. Pistoner knows, um, we got more and more interested in the, the kinds of data and how we could make a difference, so we kept adding indicators. And schools should use these data for these are the references and very important websites. I want to thank you for your interest and uh, encourage you to move forward on this important subject. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mike and Anne. We really appreciate you uh, providing this great content for our listeners. And I just want to remind everybody that we are going to be sharing um, at some point this week before the weekend a post-webinar email where we will provide a number of different resources, including a recording of today's presentation, a link to Anne's slides, um, several links that provide uh, pretty much the content that uh, Mike presented to you, we will also include a, an evaluation um, so that you can, for those of you who are seeking continuing education, um, and um, if, if uh, we need to double check here, if, we, if there were any questions that were submitted, we will respond to those and include that response in the follow-up uh, email. So thank you very much for your time today, and also if you want to access um, the allergyhome.org website that uh, Mike shared with you um, and has is the founder of um, that is available. You know, obviously through that link, um, but we also have it on the ASHA website under our on our resources page, where you'll find a number of other different resources related to school health. Thank you very much, and we hope to uh, to present to you soon with another webinar. Thank you. Bye bye.